It's a real pleasure and honor to be here today. I really appreciate, Kevin, the invitation to come out and share some of our experiences over the years uh, with the issue of transparency. Uh, very impressed with the initial presentation that fits very well with uh, all of our industries. Uh, and I got to share with you that at Select Milk Producers, which is our major parent company to all the companies I'll be talking to, we're doing our share. Uh, we just finished a manufacturing plant in Michigan. Uh, we're now uh, barely starting up and already expanding. So we're adding uh, three lines of uh, ESL and aseptic lines and a yogurt line, and also looking at building a future plant right now, trying to locate a plant on the west also. So things are, uh, are, are continue to move forward for us as well. Uh, I've been asked to share with you uh, our experience on the issues of transparency. So I, I want to go back a little bit and, and share with you my personal history real quick in two or three minutes and, and kind of bring this along. So as Joyce said, I'm a veterinarian by profession. My specialty is in, in animal food production. I did work as a veterinarian right after school and worked in small animals and large animals. And I was raised uh, since I was a kid uh, on a farm around animals. So pigs and chickens, uh, back then it was a mixture of everything. So uh, as I uh, started my practice and realized that the only people that really paid their bills well were dairy farmers, I thought I'd specialize in, in, uh, in dairy farming because I enjoyed that as well as anything else and I'd like to get paid and make a living at what I was doing. But no, my heart had already been with uh, dairy cows as I grew up and, and, and I focused. I worked for a while, went back and specialized in, in dairy production. So to put you in a timetable, this is about 19, in the late 70s, uh, and I not only had a veterinarian practice and consulting with large dairies in Southern California, but I had the opportunity to invest and start my own dairies at that time. <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if you go back to that time period as, and you look at everything Joyce presented about what we're, what we're, what we're focused on today with sustainability and and traceability and all the issues that we look at and what business was back in the 70s, uh, which was all about business. I mean, all we focused on is how, how are we going to make this business work. The outside world wasn't much that we had to worry about. Uh, uh, it, was, it was productivity, productivity, productivity. So as, as our businesses continued to evolve, uh, you know, there were, I was consulting with dairymen that, that uh, as people would move in closer to these farms and they would complain about odor. Uh, the dairyman would say, you know, it smells like money to me, which was, I thought, a terrible answer, but that was their answer. And they'd complain about flies, and they'd say, well, I was here first. And you got away with that in the 80s. I mean, it was very simple. You, that, that was your answer. You kept on doing business, and it was all about the productivity of your farm, and, and you move forward. The change, I think, started somewhere in the mid-80s. We started to see a change. And, and again, my, my training in my, in my love for animals and, and my training for efficiency on dairy farms had a mentality that th these, these type of answers, I, I didn't find them very favorable for our industry. So I always focused on the environmental side of our dairies. I focused on, on working with the community. Uh, but in, in 85, I really started noticing a, a, a big change where, where people uh, started to have a little more of a say in what our businesses were going to be like. And as you know, as we transitioned into the 90s, uh, then we started empowering people. And as the internet came along, we truly empowered people. And that's where the big change started to occur. And the recognition for transparency for us to be successful businesses really started to grow in my mind. And, 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 I, and personally, you know, I was excited about this because I felt that I had prepared our businesses all along with that mentality. And I could see a lot of businesses around me <coughs> that had not had that approach and, and were a little bit behind the curve on understanding where this was all headed. So, uh, but at the same time, groups such as PETA, the Sierra Club, the Humane Society continued to evolve and, and to get more and more power. Uh, so it wasn't only that people had a say and a rightful say and, and a say that we as, as uh, production people, be it manufacturing or primary production like we were in, that we, we need to listen to it, it, and, and understand it. But it got also to the point where other people started telling our story. And, and that's the crucial moment that uh, 
I saw people run for the weeds when, when the PETAs of the world uh, started to gain this momentum and in, in my particular case in agriculture, only 2% of the country is really intimately involved in agriculture so they truly understand uh, what, what's happening at the agricultural level. So it's easy for a group who is, who is uh, well funded and is, is, uh, can create a script to tell someone else's story if the person they're telling that story to is not familiar with what we're doing. So this started to evolve uh, quickly in the 90s, in the mid-90s towards the year 2000, where other people started telling agricultural story. At the same time in agriculture, we were growing into efficiencies, and, and efficiencies of scale. And, and uh, the, uh, the reality in, in, in people's mind, the little red barn and, and, and the cow and the pasture is something that, that is appealing, but really is not sustainable. Uh, I'm not saying that there's not some great small farms that can be efficient under certain circumstances, but we all know in this room, because manufacturing is what we do, we all know that scale and efficiencies come, come together. So as we continue to grow as, as agriculture entities, as these organizations continue to tell our story, because now they, it was easy for them to communicate in the new era, what did we do? We closed our doors. We said, whoa, I don't want anyone to come to my farm. You know, stay away. And I have to admit that, that, that we made the same mistake. Uh, I'll share with you that <coughs> we had farms in California and New Mexico and other areas of the country and, and, and decided that, you know, the, the, the best model to get away from the issues that were evolving was to create a model with a lot of land. Back in the 90s, land was very reasonable. Farmland was extremely reasonable because of the high support price to corn. That all relates to the price of land. So we, we decided this model to get away from what's happening is to have enough land to manage everything properly like we wanted to and close our gates around us and not have anyone bother us and just let us do our work. An evolutional thought, but not one that would uh, last very long. So we bought some really large farms in the Midwest one of them called Fair Oaks Farms, and we're going to talk about it today. It's 30,000 acres. And, uh, and, we, and I truly thought, this is 97, 98, I truly thought, okay, we'll do this perfect. We will have nothing wrong from an environmental standpoint of view, from an animal welfare standpoint of view, because we do all this right. And uh, no one's going to bother us anymore. We'll focus on productivity and uh, move forward. Well, it took, I, we filled gymnasiums of people in no time because they wanted to know what we were doing and with the county commissioners. And so instead of going to a county office, they would move it to the high school gymnasium and 500 people would show up to complain about what we were doing. And, and that's where I made the transition of transparent. That's when it hit me that there's no way anymore. The, I mean, this is the, the world has changed and it is absolutely imperative that if we're going to stay in business and we're going to, to move forward and, and grow and have scale, we have to communicate. We have to explain to the people what we're doing, how we're doing it. We have to share. And the reality is we look back at this quick little history I gave you, nothing that we were doing is embarrassing. We were just fearful of these groups that were telling a story for us that wasn't our story and we didn't know how to defend against it. So we decided to take a stand on that and, uh, and open up our door, open up our gates to the public. And I'll just share with you really quickly, we, last year we had 500,000 visitors to the farm and I wanna show you a few things about that and, and, and discuss about that. But I'll start with a, a little clip I have here. It's about a five minute clip. This is a YouTube uh, video done uh, by, uh, a local Midwestern uh, TV station, but it has two, uh, two mil over two million hits on YouTube already, and uh, <coughs> there's been a series of them. Uh, people show up and they're a tour and they shoot, you know how it is today, they'll shoot their own stuff and they'll show it, and we keep a good eye on that, and, and they're all positive. I'm amazed of how, how positive every YouTube that's out there about us uh, is, and I'm gonna discuss uh, some points on that here in a second. We also did, uh, I don't know, if 
some of you may have had the opportunity to see some of the uh, uh, Dirty Jobs. We did a great series, a one-hour series on Fair Oaks Farms on Dirty Jobs. If you ever get a chance to see it, I think it's phenomenal. Our CEO, um, when I founded uh, uh, Fair Oaks and Gary came to work with us, he's done just a phenomenal job. Uh, and as he mentioned there, uh, there's three simple messages that we opted on when we opened this up. We're good to the environment. We love our cows. Milk is safe and nutritious for you. So we keep it simple, fun, entertaining. And last year we did achieve 500,000 people visited the farm and growing. Uh, let me share with you that I got some slides that I see the time and I have to run through here, but there's some key thought process that I, I'd like to share. <laughs> Uh, one of them is that this has been so successful for us, uh, and, it, and it's, and yes, did I have to change some of the methods that we farmed, and did I have to sacrifice a little bit? Uh, I did, but but as you become transparent, as you open your businesses, there's not a place on that dairy or our processing plants that I don't stand and ask myself, could I bring in the biggest critic that doesn't understand anything we're doing? and bring them through there and make them feel okay. And that, that's the mentality of the entire business has changed that way because of this experience. Not only on this farm, not only on the processing plants on this farm, but throughout our whole organization, that change has occurred or, and it continues to occur. It's a constant training, it's a constant talk, but that is the mentality. Is there any place that I feel I have to hide at all? Because I want, I want it all to be seen. And again, it has made us change some of our practices, but that's good, that, that has been good. There's other parts where you have to draw a line in the <coughs> sand and say, I can't change that. Uh, in spite of what everyone thinks, I have to educate, I have to be able to explain it, I have to be able to show that. And then, and you have, and, and, and it's hours and days and weeks of, of trial and error of how to get that message out and you test it with the public until you know you got it and then people start really understanding it and that's becomes a whole part of the business. So with that said, I'm gonna to try to get through some slides here very quickly. Uh, again, it's through uh, education, entertainment. Uh, we do tours, everyone sees absolutely everything in the farm. Uh, and I'm gonna run through these real quick because I wanna to get to um, uh, some of the great things we're doing, which uh, from an environmental standpoint of view, uh, using this manure, capturing the gas, decreasing our carbon footprint. I mean, we truly, like you had a slide there that showed that 34% of your people, I think, know their carbon footprint. We truly understand our carbon footprint to, to the um, as a dairy industry and as Fair Oaks Farms. I, I'm the chairman of the sustainability committee for the entire dairy industry, and we commissioned our LCA and, and understand it very well. And dairy farmers are adapting it. And, and uh, the help of a digester being able to capture and destroy that methane and create a renewable energy but not only do we now create electricity, since that video you saw, you can see these trucks up there, we're taking 12 million miles off the road of uh, diesel and doing them with CNG, concentrated natural gas with our own trucks. But that is CNG that's renewable CNG, it's not a fossil fuel, it's coming from our manure as well and we're cleaning that and running that. So, so these, these type of efforts are appreciated by the public. You're gonna see some research here in a second which puts it low on their concerns, but I'm gonna tie those into association here in a second. But these type of efforts blow people away when they actually get to see and understand what, what's being accomplished from an environmental standpoint of view. Uh, basically, obviously, we, we try to bring all this to the different products we make. I was gonna talk a little bit about some of these products, Core Powers. Uh, we, we obviously do some traditional milks. Uh, we, we supply some great companies, uh, some of them in this room, uh, with raw milk. So, uh, and then we do some very specialty products. So we're involved in every aspect of, of uh, production from bulk sales to uh, uh, RTDs and, and aseptic products. And, and, we take, and we take this, what I just shared with you, is part of our story. And it's a great story and it really is a great help in our sales. It really opens doors for us that we are this transparent, that people can look at our company, feel comfortable that if I tie in with these people, I'm not gonna say we won't be in the newspaper because that would be a big mistake because I'll probably be in there tomorrow, but our chances are minimized that we would be there, okay. So, so it's giving that comfort to the people that we associate throughout the whole food value chain 
uh, that, that we can do that. And, and you can, you know, the comments of some of the people that visit the farm. Okay, I'm gonna go real quick through some, um, some research uh, because uh, like everything, we all need to understand a little bit about uh, what we're trying to accomplish. And, and over the years, and as we develop our message, I keep on trying to tap into this research and, and keep on trying to refine our message. Uh, one thing that we are convinced about is it's not science. You cannot convince people with science. You have to convince them through trust, through values. They have to believe that you, you are, and, and this is our typical model today versus I was saying in the 70s, you know, it was all about, hey, um, my, my P&L and, and productivity. This is the way that we all are looking at our business. Nothing new to any of you in this room. But the, the important thing here is if you're going to be transparent and communicate a message, you can't do it with, with the upper two. You have to do it down with your values. Uh, uh, it, it, it's what creates the belief and what creates the feeling. Then you can associate the science and you have to bring in the science afterwards. But if the, you'll see through this research real quick that, that it's all about trust and, and trust comes from values. It doesn't come from science. Initially, some of our messages were scientific, bang, 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 and, and people don't buy that. As a matter of fact, they, they back off and say, ah, you know, I, I don't trust you. They, they want to trust you. They want to see your values. They want to see that, that, that you represent compassion and responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. So <laughs> some, some great surveys from uh, the uh, Center for Food Integrity is a, a company that I was involved in it's, uh, founding it. It's a, it's a national company today, and it's a phenomenal group of people, and great research is coming out for, for the food industry. Um, so just throwing out some general thought processes to a group of 2,000 people. We're represented in the U.S. I think the Indiana group's like 200, so you got two. You can see that, that the values were about the same. But interestingly enough, you know, people have a lot of other concerns that are not what I care about, and, and rightfully so. So you, that's the first thing that we all got to understand. It's not all about what we're doing. It's about what people have concerns about. And when you get down to food safety, down lower. So of, of these values that were thrown out, this is the order that they appear in. Uh, and you get into stuff that you guys are going to spend a lot of time on sustainability, which I love, as, as you could tell. And sustainability is extremely important to businesses. But when you get to the bottom line of research, it's, and, and you give people other options, it's not like they're, my, they're priority. But without it, you don't, you know, you're not gonna be there. So, um, let me, so, so when you get more into the food side of the world, as far as what I'm concerned about, so we, now we, we're zeroing in on questions on the, on the and, and you can see that, that the, the top box here is, is uh, safe food, affordable food, and nutritious food is what people care about. Duh, you know, we would expect that. It's all about me. It's not about feeding the world or it's not about sustainability. What are you doing for me is what people care about first. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's human nature and we need to understand that if we're going to communicate. And the whole trick here when our experience now is that we know this. This is what we talk about and let them know that in a, in, 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 in a way. But we, then you need to associate it to these important issues for us that understand where we need to take the industry in the future and that we believe in sustainability and we actually believe that we need to feed the world. I mean, I don't think there are very few people in this room that would disagree that in 2050 we need to be so much more efficient. We need to double our food production in this world and we don't have the resources to do it the way we're doing it today. We know that, but the general public doesn't really care. Obviously, <laughs> you can see where it is on the line here, but it's incredibly important to us. So within our message, we got to talk to them about what they care about, but through association, we can talk about this and they care about it at that level and they get educated and they believe even in you more when you're doing it that way. So the whole trick here is to understand what people care about, understand what you think is important going forward and how do you tie that in. That's, that's how we've developed our message at, uh, uh, at Fair Oaks as we move forward over the years. Uh, same graph for a smaller group of people just to show that even, even if you get into the Midwest, the first one was 2,000 people across the United States, the smaller one is a small Midwestern state. Uh, it doesn't matter, people feel about the same. Interestingly enough for, for me as a poor farmer is that uh, they don't really care if we make any money or not in either graph, so. <laughs> Uh, so, 
again, implication, safe, affordable, nutritious food is what we care about. Feeding the world, sustainable, uh, the environment, efficient, profitability food are not. Consumers don't identify with that, but again, this is what the research says. This is the research I look at. But again, through association, we make those values work. And it works incredibly well. And people do care about this. It's just they don't care as much, that's all. But they do care. It is important. If you look at a percentage basis of 30, 40, 50 percent of what they care about may be in that arena, their own priorities are a lot higher. So through association. <clears throat> Uh, basically, <clears throat> value, uh, trust, it's all about trust, so I'm going to show you a few. Uh, the value message is how we need to, to do it. So once you create the value message, I'm repeating myself here, then you bring the science in. So you, you create the value message, you tr create the trust, and you back it up with science. Uh, here's an example of that. Let's talk about animal welfare. So I would say the proper care of my animals is very important to me. We love our animals. <clears throat> we care very much about them. This is how you know, we, we made our whole business around them because we love them. And then we get into some science, and then we get into the economics. And, and in the economics, we talk about affordability for them. So, so it's a process of association to be able to get to uh, uh, the, the main points of where the future of our business is driving and get people to understand and care about that. But you've got to deal with their values first and trust. Same, this is a different uh, series of, of uh, of uh, research, and, and it's really interesting that, that in different years, probably a year apart, the, the same process as we're doing. But from our part, some of you may relate well to this, some, some may be a little bit further away from our part of the world, but, but um, it's, it's about the unknown. It's about you know the chemicals, the pesticides, the herbicides. This is what people are concerned about, and, and they're concerned about uh, you know, the food safety and, 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 and regulations are important to them. They want to know that we're regulated. That was, uh, and, and that's important to them. And we let them know that. And we, as, as we're showing them, we show them how we're regulated and, and how we go beyond that regulation. But they want to know that someone's watching and they want to know that well. But these are the, the concerns that people mainly have in the farming world. And they are most concerned, and we'll get it here in red, about the long, long term. Uh, unattended health effects of these to their children. And, uh, and finally, they uh, uh, comes down to trust. So, so how do we deal with those issues? Uh, and and, and the, the whole message for us is that everything we're doing from a sustainability point of view is focused on driving the usages of chemicals, herbicides, pesticides down. And that is what sustainable farming is all about. We are becoming more efficient, more productive, using less uh, to produce more and, uh, and, and delivering to them. So people, if they know that, that you're moving in that direction, they're very content with that. They understand the process of that. Um, so we, another area that, that, that some separate research from an uh, organization, U.S. Farm and Ranchers Alliance, a, a fairly new organization, but one that I think is going to accomplish a lot in our industry. Uh, Acknowledge their, their concerns as legitimate, so we've been talking about that all along, Let, and, and then focus on the future. So talking about improvement, constant improvement processes and what we're doing to improve and, 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 and focus on your concerns. Emphasize continuous improvement, share your personal stories, and then start getting into, into the science. So same type of research. So let me, let me jump into this real quick. Uh, I know I'm running out of time here, but, but it's interesting because when Kevin asked me if I would speak here today and share our experiences and, and how this has affected our company, which has been incredibly positive for us, then uh, this came out just a few weeks ago, as you all know. Uh, and, and, you know, today and, uh, it's about trust and, and, and obviously what happened here. So uh, if we go a little bit on the myth of pink slime is just a filler, it really isn't. We, you know, it is a, a textured beef. It, it is 90% lean. Uh, it's, used, uh, it's, it's used with chemicals that are, are non-harmful. So it's a product that, that, that is a food product that was a, an, ex, an excellent product in reality. Pink slime was a consumer backlash. So on April 12th, you know, it starts with, in 2011. And I think that's a real important date there because 
you know, if I had a product, and, and I don't know, you know who's in the room altogether, but if you're involved with a product called Pink Slime, that's your first problem. If I had a product that was called, <laughs> you know, uh, you know so, so again, this transparency issue is real, and, and, and every, people are gonna have access to every piece of your business, every piece of my business, and we can't stand on any floor and not look around and not look at a name or look at a process or look at a thought that we're not okay with letting it out to the public and letting it be vented in their eyes. If, if you can't stand in every part of your, so who was standing between all these companies and thinking pink slime? Why, why am I allowing that name? Why am I not retraining my people? Why am I not talking about them not to use this name? Let's, you know, textured beef is a, it's a terrible name. And if so, you know, lean beef, I don't know. Let's create a name. Let's create a story around this. Let's get ahead of the process here because I'm putting myself in danger. In 2011, there was a warning, a big warning. And, and I don't know what they did. I'm not involved, so I'm, I'm not trying to be critical. What I'm saying is that for a whole year, there was a warning before this really came to be what it was, and it happened. So, um, you know, then what happens, uh, you know, you have different people running in different directions and, and different accusations and everything going back and forth. And, you know, should there be a hearing? Should there be this? In reality, what there should be is, you know, internally in these businesses, we all need to look at these things and, and know how to communicate. If someone would have communicated what this is and would have had the proper name and dealt with it in the right way, uh, you know, we wouldn't be in the, in the scenario that we are. Um, so the damage control is what we all know. Different, different companies approach it different ways. Um, and uh, the reality, I don't know if you guys have done these numbers. I did those numbers the day the, when I read the article the first day when it, came, when it hit the news. I thought to myself, what is this going to cost the industry from a carbon footprint point of view? What is it going to cost from beef? Is it the highest it's ever been? I mean, it is historically high. And I'm here, and I'll tell you, because we're in the beef business as well. It's only going higher. You got normally about 42 million mother cows in this country. We got 30 million mother cows right now. So that's how depleted we are. Now you take another million and a half out that this, this the, the equates to, and it's gonna go to either animal feed, and therefore we're gonna have to cut a little deeper into a round to be able to make the ground beef, which means now, you know, prices are even gonna go higher. So the impact is phenomenal. Um, and I don't at all claim to be an expert on this case whatsoever or have any specific opinion on it. It's just the point. So if you go to the history on the pink slime, 250,000 people on change.org, two and a half million people on change.org, YouTube, Facebook, transparency. We have to look at our organizations and be able to be comfortable that this is, a, this is where we live today and this is how quick things can get out of hand and miscommunicated to an entire country. And an entire country makes decisions based on people that don't have a clue of what they were really talking about and with very little information. And if we don't have a script already that we, we understand and that we're preaching constantly and that we have quick answers to respond in 2011, immediately instead of waiting, because there's always some signs. There's always some signs. And if we, if we are ahead of the curve and we see those signs, this is what I lose sleep as a, as a company uh, CEO and owner. I lose sleep over this. So I hope that, you know, that that's probably the best thing I can communicate. I am worried about every aspect of my company from a communication and transparency point of view we have taken it, all the steps I possibly can to open up and create a story, and I know that I'm still vulnerable. I know that I'm still vulnerable to things like this, and, and I focus constantly on it, and I can only share, you know, leave you with those thoughts that after all the effort that we have put into this, I still lose sleep about it, especially when we go through these. And, and, and change.org to me is, uh, you know, I have nothing against it. I think communication is great, but change.org to me is the example of how we have empowered the, the, the consumer and the, and the public 
with, the, with, with just an incredible ability of information that may be misinformation if we allow it to be misinformation. So uh, I will end with that. Uh, I think there's some time for some questions. Is, yes, thank you. Anyone have any questions? Kevin? Yeah, not to pick on uh, pink slime, Mike, but you know, I, I don't know, where, because it's a, it's a good example for the whole industry, was the mistake, they knew that this was gonna happen sooner or later and they tried to have a game plan, but they didn't implement it until they're in the news. Is that too late? I mean, do you have to be really proactive and you know, have, have, your, uh, have your tours and be more open, or otherwise the game is over? Absolutely, Kevin. That's what I, I, I believe very, very strongly that, uh, that we've got to be ahead of the incident. We have to have our script written. We, we have to believe in it. We, we truly have to have made changes within it because we don't want to be defending ourselves. We want to be telling a story, a story that, that is true, honest, that is compassionate, that it truly is fair to everyone, to the consumer specifically. And, and if we're not looking at these things, there's stuff within, I'm sure, Pink Slime that needed to be changed to be able to tell the story, right? Just like there was stuff within our dairy farms and our processing that we have changed because we said, hey, we're gonna open up and come and look. And I had to change management practices that were sound. But perception, the old cliche is that perception is reality and I, there was no way I was gonna be able to change the public's perception on that sound practice and you have to then balance you know is it worthwhile do I draw a line do I focus on explaining it or do I just kind of switch a little bit I might lose a tad of efficiency but it's okay I'll do it this way and it's more appealing and that's okay so there is a, a gray zone there that as a operators we need to be able to define as we create a story that's solid that, that people will trust and believe in and have it ready because if you if you wait till it hits, it, it's too late. People panic. People don't know what to say. They say the wrong things. It spirals downwards. It's way too late. Mike, uh, first of all, great presentation. Very very timely in Thank today's you. today's world. Uh, two questions or comments. One, especially with the um, the note up there about the consumer's concern about unintended consequences for their children. I noticed GMO did not have any part in your discussion. Are, is that part of your concern? And if so, could you comment on that? I know it's more a European issue, but nonetheless, it's out there. And then secondly, in getting your message out, <clears throat> did you engage outside expertise or did you build your own communications capability to get this word out? Great, thank you. So let me address the GMO side first. Uh, the, the only reason there wasn't a GMO mentioned in there is because I took that information directly from the research. I, didn't, I did not create my own concerns for you there because we do talk about GMO at the farm. Uh, GMO is less of a concern, obviously, to the, to the consumer. It's more about the pesticides, the herbicides, the chemicals. So the, the beauty about GMO, which we're a big user and believer in GMO, because uh, GMO has a, has, a, has a sound science backing, which, again, we talk about as a secondary effect. But the importance about GMO is that it's drought resistant. It's pest resistant. So therefore, we use less herbicides. We use less chemicals. Uh, we can have more productivity with less. So GMOs are what helping us get to be able to reduce these other, uh, other things that are of major concern. So that's uh, a very nice tie-in. People, people get it. Uh, they, 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 they understand it. Um, uh, so in, in our country right now, we're not seeing that big resistance. Obviously, in Europe, we're seeing a big resistance. My, my personal observation about GMOs and where they're headed, we will win the battle on the GMO front. Uh, as, as we get into the next 10 years and this efficiency becomes more important. You're seeing it in China already. You know, China's been against these GMOs, but you know, I, I travel quite a bit there now and, and you know, it's, it's, it's about ready to change and, and it will start giving in, in, in Russia and the Ukraine where we're seeing a lot of productivity coming on board. There is no way we're gonna get from here to there without GMOs and GMOs truly uh, have a great story behind them of safe, so, so I'm, I'm very comfortable that 
And again, through the research that we're doing here, we're seeing that GMOs are not the first thing in this country that people are concerned about. Again, they're concerned about these herbicides and pesticides. The beauty is that GMO drives the use of those way down. Uh, your second question, sorry, was? Uh, internal versus external communications expertise. Did you use one or the other, both? How did both, you absolutely both. I mean, we've, we, we, when we started this, we were a little bit concerned and afraid, and we went around and did use a lot of consulting. And, and what I've attached to now is research, uh, constantly trying to understand the public, what's in their minds, and, and, and this type of research and others is what we use to re continue to refine our message. It's kind of timely that you uh, use the pink slime as an example. Uh, the birthing, the calving uh, uh, auditorium we had was very impressive and people seemed to like that. But at the other end of her productive life, the cow becomes pink slime. How do you finesse that part of your message? Great question. Uh, uh, people are always concerned. That, matter of fact, they, <laughs> they go to the farm and they tour and they ask if we actually bury our cows. Uh, do we have a burial <laughs> ground? Because you know, they get enamored with, with, with uh, so they start humanizing the, the effort. And, uh, and that's obviously very uh, rewarding to us. But at the same time, now we've got to deal with the reality. So we, we have it very nicely tied in and we do explain very clearly that these cows have a productive life in the milk business and go to market after that and that they create a very nice lean beef because dairy cows do create a very lean beef. It's what we do with that beef as it gets to, uh, to the hamburger world that gets added with a little fat. But it's a very lean beef and very economical and affordable beef compared to high-end cuts of beef. So we explain it in that fashion and people are engaged in the business and they're seeing this is a business but at the same time everything's being done right and treated right and they and they become more they, they come more acceptance of it and and we have a 98 percent this is internal research going back to your question of of the people coming in and done by third party dmi which is dairy market incorporated this is research for us 98 percent of the people that visit the farm leave with, with a fantastic attitude they are, they are good with those type of answers. They, they understand it. We don't make fun of it. You know, I've heard one or two employees once say, you know, they go to a second career. I don't find that amusing. So that get, those type of things, you know, you're on, it's the same concept of someone using the word pink slime. You've got you to gotta make sure that your communication is, is uh, always respectful. And people really appreciate that, 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 that although these animals, they've served us well, they, 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 they go to market, but they go to market in a very respectful way. We, we actually have, you know, talk about transportation and how even, the, even the slaughterhouses that we use or the rendering houses that we use, that they're certified through, through the proper processes of humane treatment of animals all the way through their euthanasia. So all these steps are very, very important to communicate in a very respectful way and people just get it. They, 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 they accept it. There's always going to be that 2% and, and, and I probably answer, uh, I don't know, 20 emails a month uh, uh, that, are, that are reasonable, but they're in that 2%. And then there's two or three emails I wouldn't even touch. I mean, it's just impossible. There's, there are people that, that we just can't, we'll never communicate with, uh, unfortunately, but that's, that's a very small percentage as compared to what I expected when, I, when we opened the farm like this. I truly thought that I'd be dealing with 10 or 20% of people that, that we'd have to explain more and more. And, and I'll share with you, <clears throat> what people really care about is they just want to know you're taken care of. It. They just got to see enough, and they say, you know what? They care, they're honest, and, and I'm okay with this. I got my own problems. As we saw on that first slide, people have their own problems. They, they just want a little peace of mind. It's not a lot that they're looking for after putting millions of people through the farms and through our processing plants, I can tell you, they're not looking for a, a lot. They're just looking to get comfortable with you. And it doesn't take a lot to get there. Any other questions? Kevin? Yeah, Mike, uh, you know, well, I, one of the, the first things I heard about your operation was that you had a, a veterinarian uh, on staff who's uh, job was uh, cow comfort Absolutely. and and this really paid off I mean, in productivity but uh, it, that kind of investment is that the kind of thing that you're just doing a, a gut feeling for it or did you know going in that you know if I hire 
this guy at six figures, I'm going to get a lot more back. Yeah. I, I don't think that there's a, a single thing that, that we have done to do what we did that wasn't sustainable from a, business, from a true sustainability, if we look at that sustainability triangle we showed earlier. I, I, there's nothing really that I'm doing there that I wouldn't be doing probably otherwise. I might be communicating it different or whatnot. But uh, no, I, I think it's a mistake if we start doing things in our businesses just to impress people or because uh, it, it, there's, we can do enough and people understand enough if you put it on sound-based, sustainable thought process. And, 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 and if there's not, now I'm not gonna say that you, you shouldn't be a risk taker and you shouldn't be a good business person to be able to see if I invest in this, yeah, I'm gonna lose probably, it's a two, three year return, I'm gonna lose money for a while and it might not work and I'll have to back out and change it. Now those, but you don't make the decision if you don't see that sooner or later this is a profitable decision and it's gonna move the business forward and it's gonna be positive for the public. I mean, all those things have to be in there. If not, you know, there's another thing you can find. You're wasting your time putting something in just to whitewash it or greenwash it or however we wanna call it right now would be a terrible mistake. So, so my answer to specifically uh, Dr. Gordy Jones, who you're referring to, he was a great investment because I know that animal comfort and if I can maximize animal comfort, I can maximize productivity. Now, people are gonna love it. The cows have sand bedding and they look like they're at the beach when they, when they drive through and you know, people love all those things and it's a great story and I use it tremendously, but it puts me at a level of production and quality of milk that's superior to any, anything I could do otherwise. So, so it, it all has value, but also ties into our story. So Mike, I, I've been to the farm several times and I find myself pushing the kids out of the way to watch them making cheese and, and doing all that stuff. But uh, it's a very public and open experience when you go there and your employees are, at, let's call it, at risk of, of, of talking to the public and saying things. Is there any special training that you've given them to make sure that what they say is what you want to get out? You know, we, uh, we thank you. I appreciate your comment and, uh, and uh, I'm very proud of, of our employees and, and how they've embraced this. But, you know, it comes with leadership. And, and, and I'm talking about Gary Corbett and people that, that, were, that, that everyone buys into what we're doing. And, and, it's, and it's getting that feeling throughout the entire company that this is the right thing to do. People deserve to know. People care. We are very proud of what we do, and we want to share that. So, so getting that feeling through is, is Number one, it's the biggest, biggest step to be successful in this venture. Uh, just to, with that said, we do have monthly meetings in the evenings, and obviously we pay our employees to be there, and we put on skits and have fun and, and make, make, make a lot out of it, but we spend a lot of time on that. Again, is that money, going back to the question, is that money that is well invested? Absolutely, because because these employees really believe and people like yourself that visit sense that you, you feel that from them and and Fair Oaks Farm become it, they are part of what make people believe that everything we're doing there is being taken care of and they don't have to worry about it because they have this sense of happiness that even the people there are happy not only the cows but everyone is happy with what they're doing and very proud of what they're doing so that is a uh, immense value to our brand and and, and to, to move our, our effort forward. So we put a lot, a lot, a lot of time from the top. We, it's all about passion at the end, everything, every business, if, you know, the success is about passion. So the passion comes from the top. Our top people really understand this and really believe this. And then we, we, we help the entire company to feel that. Mike, great topic. You know, whether it's uh, pink slime or whether it's Franken food or whether it's GMO and all the other people are out there looking for attention to make a name for themselves. But there's got to be a certain level of responsibility. You're a producer. You can't fight that battle on your own. So I think a lot of us take a look at the industry organizations, the Dairy Institute Association, the American Meat Institute, those watchdog groups to be able to fight a faceless attack on your livelihood. 
Where do you think the ownership lies to be able to combat, combat that with the truth? So I might be on, 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 on the wrong side of, of, of the answer of that question. I, in the industry, I think I'm a little recognized of being on the wrong side of that. Uh, I really believe it's an individual battle. And, and unfortunately, in, in, in the farming industry, I run across a lot of farmers that say, you know, I want to do it my way and the hell with it and I don't want these people here and, you know. So we're our worst enemy. And it starts with the individual. And, and yeah, these associations are great and we need them and everything else, but um, again, if we don't have that foundation from, from, from the bottom uh, and, and the belief, then, then we're going to have those bad apples out there that aren't taking care of business. It doesn't matter what these people say. Uh, uh, if we don't have that strong foundation. Now, we're never going to have it perfect, and, and, and that's where the fine line comes. Uh, we're going to have the Humane Society get an employee in, in a pig farm, and he's going to take a video, and, and he's going to find a bad apple. And they probably you know, might have to go to 40 of them and find one, and unfortunately, that's what gets out there. So, so I understand both sides of the coin here, but I'm not one to say we need our associations to protect us we do need that. National Milk, I'm on the executive board of National Milk, and we, we have a farm program, and we've worked very hard to have a farm program to protect. We can't get a lot of the farmers to participate in the farm program that we've developed that's kind of light, in my opinion. It's not as tough as I'd like to see it, but, but, but it's a good program. And we can't get a hundred, you know, that 90% that, that embrace, we can't get 50% embraced. Uh, and that's an issue. So it comes from the bottom. We need strong organizations to, to be able to speak for us. I think the, the uh, Center for Food Integrity, is a, I, I really like it. The Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, I think, is going to be a phenomenal organization representing. Those two, uh, keep an eye on them. They're, they're fairly new, but, they're, but I, I know the leadership in both of them, and I think it's going to be excellent. We're very supportive of them, and we need those organizations. But again, we need to get our individuals to really buy into it, to give all these people the support to be able to speak for us. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure sharing this.